the call to ministry. I think it is my Guyanese ex experience that made me so astounded. You know, I have a lot of young males just answering any calls. They're not even listening. Today I look forward eagerly to his address. Um, but before before I allow him to speak with you and to you, I wish to thank him for arranging his schedule so that he could join us in this celebration today. Reverend Cohen, thank you so much. We really appreciate that. And so ladies and gentlemen, I now hand you over to the Reverend Dr. Colin Cowan. Thank you very much, Reverend Messiah, for this welcome and introduction to the Kirk. And thank you for this great privilege and honor to be sharing in this very milestone celebration of the witness of the St. Andrew's Kirk here in Georgetown, Guyana. Today there are some of my colleagues from the Council for World Mission who are in worship with us. They were here for a special um, consultation on a new financial and economic architecture that the ecumenical community together is thinking and dreaming about. And uh, I'm very pleased and delighted to, to associate them with the welcome that has been extended to me. You will pardon me if I make mention of um, one other person in this audience today, and that is um, Pastor Small, which when I first met him, um, he was just a small. <laughs> and um, he, along with um, Reverend Oswald Best and um, Reverend Dave Bismarck, were among the outstanding leaders of the Guyana community who participated in the shaping of my own journey. And I'm delighted, sir, to see you here um, today. And to thank you once again for the um, encouragement and support that you've given. I mean, Reverend Masai is right that I was quite a, a reserved, um, even shy, um, pastor in the early days of my life. God has been good to me. Let us pray. Lord, speak to me and grant the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts may be truly acceptable to you. Our theme for today, call to witness by the power of the Holy Spirit. By way of introduction, I would like to talk about the provocative nature of this Holy Spirit, especially in times of human stubbornness. The consideration of this theme is to witness to the power of the Holy Spirit. Both terms are troublesome. First of all, witness is not passive. It means one's readiness to stand up for what he or she believes to stand up for a cause, even to die for that cause. When Jesus invited his disciples to be his witnesses, he was inviting them to be his representation in a hostile environment. That is, his voice and presence to those who crucified him. They were expected to speak truth to power, to tell the truth that Jesus was crucified by decision of the corporate boardroom and without proper trial. Mm -hmm. 
but that God raised him from the dead, thereby giving him authority over all of life. They were to tell the truth that Jesus preached a message of salvation to all people and that in his mission there was a place for all. They were to tell the truth that Jesus was about building an alternative community to the Roman Empire that was based on justice and peace, free from corruption and deceptive politics, even open to all people, Jews and Gentiles alike. So, witness is not passive. It is a strong word that speaks to advocacy, protest, even militants in terms of one's parting company with the ordinary and taking sides with God. The Holy Spirit is God's intervention into human story, bringing clarity in times of uncertainty, prompting us to action in times of complicity, or calling us to new ways of thinking and being in community. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit is come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. According to John, the Spirit blows where it wills. For the disciples of Jesus on the occasion of Pentecost, the Spirit came in the form of a rushing mighty wind. In Elijah's experience, the Spirit came in the form of a still small voice. For those of the Emmaus road, the Spirit caused a burning in their hearts. For Mary, the mother of Jesus, the Spirit left her pondering, pondering in her heart. The Spirit is God's gift of presence in times of uncertainty, complex, complicity, and in need for the cause of community. So, for St. Andrew's Kirk and those of us here gathered today, to witness in the Spirit is to open ourselves to the movement and prompting of the Spirit. A Spirit that cannot and will not be contained in the neat little boxes that church tends to create. Rather, the Spirit calls out calls us out of our comfort zones, out of the cave of convenience, into the community of pain and struggle, out from the upper room of security, into the marketplace of corruption and deception. Your theme called to witness in the power of the Spirit is a reminder that our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria represents the hopes and fears of all the earth and that to witness in such a context calls us to be mindful that the ends of the earth is dominated by greed and hostility resulting in untold poverty, inequality and disregard for the environment. Therefore, to witness in such a context is a tough assignment. A tough assignment requiring the presence and power of the Holy Spirit as a constant source of inspiration, prompting, prodding, even provoking an alternative way of thinking and being. So, if we 
we really take seriously this call to witness, then I suggest that we have got to be prepared to move from the position of prejudice to purposeful engagement. In my reflections for today, I call attention to one biblical story in which prejudice, pride, and preoccupation with self constitute a paradigm and epistemology with immense potential to destroy life. However, the same story, influenced by the Spirit, offers the possibility of purposeful engagement, positive presence, and a life-transforming partnership with others. It's a story of the encounter between Peter and Cornelius, found in Acts chapters 10 and 11. In that story, both Cornelius and Peter had a dream simultaneous. They each saw the Spirit of God who spoke to them. In the case of Peter, the Spirit spoke that he should get over himself and his prejudice. To Cornelius, the invitation was to reach out and invite Peter to join him in his house and to talk to him about the Spirit. And in the end, they met. Conversation ensued and a partnership developed between the Jews and the Gentiles and the Gentiles were incorporated into the community of faith. So, there we go. From prejudice to purposeful engagement. From this high horse of prejudice, Peter's dream shows the kind of person he is and how contrary to the Spirit's movement. In response to the Spirit's prompting to get up, kill and eat, Peter's stout-hearted arrogance is revealed. I have never eaten anything that is impure or unclean. Little did he know that at the very same moment, the same spirit had visited Cornelius' house, made the arrangement for him to be confronted in a face-to-face -face battle with his prejudice. In this moment of wondering and pondering over his dream, the spirit beckoned him to come to terms with himself and to get ready to receive the visitors Cornelius had sent to his gate. These visitors were mere messengers. Their story was clear and concise. Our master is a righteous and God-fearing man. A holy angel spoke to him and he has asked us to come and invite you to visit him. Simple. Get off your high horse. An invitation is awaiting you to visit a Gentile and his house. The real actor in this story is God's Holy Spirit, penetrating the heart of Peter and calling him to full understanding of what it means to be a witness for God in Christ. To cut a long story short, Peter responded to the invitation and after providing hospitality for the visitors, he went to Cornelius' house, shared the message of salvation with him and his entire household was baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by extension received into the community of faith. This is a remarkable account of one moving from prejudice to purposeful engagement. And should St. Anatus Kirk accept this invitation, you would be following the traditions out of which the Kirk was founded. Because from as early as 1821, as we heard earlier, this church opened its doors to receive the slaves as members. According to history, this St. Andrew's Kirk is the first church in Diana built by the Europeans to receive slaves into membership. 
1821. From prejudice to purposeful adventure is the calling of those who would take witnessing to the love and power of Jesus seriously. But I said the movement is reminded of Anselm that Ignis is meeting Anselm moving from pride to positive presence. A movement from pride to positive presence. Peter responded to the prompting of God's Spirit and visited for years himself. However, he remained on his high horse for as long as he could. Pride would not allow him to dismount too quickly. So here are his first words of address to the gathering on the right of the Cornelius himself. Listen to these words. You are well aware that it is against our law for Jews to associate with or visit the Delta. But God has shown me that I should not call anything to cheer or so, I came without raising any objection. But Peter is clear that his visit has nothing to do with him. Had he his way, he would have remained faithful to the ceremonial laws of the Jews and he would not have visited his Gentile people. It is all about God and God alone. Let us take note of how stubborn this pride is. First of all, Peter declares, you are well aware that it is against our law to associate with or visit a Gentile. What is at play here? that would make it possible to have such an exclusive law. And what is going on in one's consciousness to allow him to speak so stoutly about such a law? What is going on? Secondly, we know clearly states, God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. In this statement, it's a public confession that Peter does not regard Gentiles as anything but impure and unclean. For this, he is not apologizing. He is here because God has rebuked him. He is here because God says, go. Oh, it is not because anything in him has been changed. And thirdly, Peter notes that he is here on demand. I came without raising any objection, meaning it was not his doing at all. Notwithstanding this position of pride, Peter ended up spending quite a few days in Cornelius' house at Cornelius' invitation. Despite the earlier pronouncement that Jewish law prohibits a visit, let alone spending time with the Gentiles, Peter accepted Cornelius' invitation. And this time in Cornelius' house provided an opportunity to build fellowship and to preach the divide. My sisters and brothers, it is important for us to note that what went on between the arrival of Peter in Caesarea and the invitation of Cornelius for Peter to stay in his house for some days is a miracle. The Spirit took over and made something beautiful of an awkward, pride-filled and prejudicial situation. The way is faith for Cornelius, who open up themselves to be ministered to by Peter. We are all here, he says. 
We are all here to, to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. And in Peter's presentation, he found himself preaching what he does not practice. Now, on one occasion, Jesus said to his disciples, do what they say, but not what they do. Because in Jesus' understanding, they have the right words of the Torah to speak. But their attitude and their lifestyle is inconsistent with that word. It is the same thing that is going on here with Peter now. Peter is preaching what he does not practice, but don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. I mean, the church people like to say, um, we don't want to go to church because there will be different principles there. Don't worry about that. Uh, the Spirit of God has a way of penetrating our words, taking God's word through God's Spirit beyond the frailty and the limitations of human time. I now realize, says Peter, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts from every nation those who fear God and do what is right. And while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. That is a miracle of transformation. Those who came with Peter were astonished at this unexpected outpouring of the Spirit on the Gentiles. And these are the words we're noting. These are the words we're noting. No one can stand in their way. No one can stand in their way. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. No one can stand in their way. Uh, no one can stand in their way in the same way that no one could stand in the way of Reverend Oswald Best when he became the first native Guyanese to be pastor and moderator of this church in 19. 74. Or no one can stand in their way in the same way that the current minister, the first female to be ordained and to serve this church as moderator. Both Reverend Otto Best and Reverend Marie Messiah have demonstrated trustworthiness and leadership acumen befitting their place in the history making of this great community of faith. I pay tribute to them for their outstanding leadership and for their place in the making of history. From prejudice to purposeful engagement. From pride to positive presence. And thirdly, from preoccupation to self, to partnership with others. I would like to put it to you that when the Holy Spirit takes control of our lives, our prejudices, our pride, and our preoccupation with self are transformed into life transforming options. This story of Peter and Cornelius is a miracle of healing which led Peter and the religious community coming to terms with their biases, accepting what they could not control and embracing the Spirit's call for community. In recognizing that the Spirit moves 
us, we done ourselves. Peter was able to address the church community to which he belongs. So chapter 11 of Acts of the Apostles. The council in Jerusalem confronted Peter with the incredulous news that he meddled with the Gentiles and the uncircumcised. How could you? They asked. You went into the house of uncircumcised people and ate with them? Unheard of. And Peter responded with the counter position. This position is simple. The two words of, from Shaq, or maybe Shaq, two words from me. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. Uh, so, this, so, he said, if God gave them the same gift God gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? Who was I to think I could stand in God's way? If God did for them the same thing God did for us, who was I to stand in God's way? So Peter recounted the full story, invited the church into a process of discernment and helped them to see that Christian weakness through the power of the Holy Spirit moves us to align ourselves with the plan of God, to reframe our perspectives and to act beyond ourselves. The council, the council who hear you is met with Peter's, it wasn't me. On that shabby note, Peter is not disassociating himself from his action. What he's doing is making the point that this action was informed and influenced by the power of the Holy Spirit, leaving him compelled and constrained to act in faithful obedience to the Spirit's beckoning. It wasn't me. It is all about God. It's all about God's Spirit that descended upon me, took control of my emotions, and caused me to do that which seems unthinkable. So here we go. <laughs> the world of brokenness, division, and strife. I believe God wants us to bridge the divide and to build just and inclusive relationships. By advice, I speak to the brokenness between humanity and the environment, between men and women, between the young and the old, between and among the ethnic peoples here in this country, between church and society. Just relationships call for economic equity in which poverty is eradicated. Hunger is stopped and world's resources more equitably distributed to meet the needs of all creation. Just relationships call for inclusive and life-affirming communities where gender equality, sexual diversity, and racial integration are part of the design of society, paving the way for a society in which all are included and none is denied a place. Just relationships call for environmental integrity, Amen. where due consideration is given to the health and well-being of the oceans, where due protection is guaranteed for the land and the forestry, Amen. and where the fish, birds, and wildlife that populate air, land, and sea are regarded 
as vital components of God's creation and equal contenders in an economy of life for all. Paul, the witness by the power of the Holy Spirit, is a call to move away from a preoccupation with self, to build in partnerships of integrity that are life-affirming and just. Here are the profound and transformative culminating words that brought the meeting of Jews and Gentiles together in one Christian community. When they heard this, when the council in Jerusalem heard the story of Peter, they had no further objection. And they praised God's sake. So that even the Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Let me conclude. I conclude by making this bold statement that the power of the Holy Spirit can and does do the extraordinary. I would like to ask, what does this subject of all witness by the power of the Holy Spirit mean for Sedan's church and the church in the land? How might this bicentenary anniversary become an opportune moment for the church to reposition itself to respond to the call to be witnesses? How might this church and the wider Christian community of Diana witness to the power of the Holy Spirit which calls us to resist the tendency for prejudice, crime, and preoccupation with self in order to more fully engage with God's mission, building a culture of trust, dismantling walls of separation, and caring for all of God's creation. Let us remind ourselves of two important and related facts of the history. First of all, as I said earlier, St. Andrew's Church was established in 1818, and by 2021, by, sorry, by 1821, it started to admit slaves into the membership because Reverend Archibald Brown was concerned about the welfare of the slaves. Never mind that they were sitting on top, but there is a bit irony in that. And um, our historian was, was shocked in noting that the democracy was sitting down here. Maybe not looking up. The concentration is on things below, not above. But from above, the slaves would look down and see what is happening. That aside. The second important point I want to know about the history is that by 1841, the Church of Spartan established the first primary school here under the auspices of the church because Reverend James Southers believed that free slaves should be trained should be educated in order to intelligently participate in all life. And then that sort of one of the gifts of the liberated missionaries, some of them were not like that. Some of them polluted with the plantocracy and um, provided an education that made the slaves, the slaves subservient to the plantocracy. Smith was different, for example, who was then sentenced to death and died in prison before that happened. Southers, or Southers rather, felt that the street slaves should be trained. <laughs> if we would continue in the tradition of our ancestors, we must be prepared to act 
in faithful obedience to God's Spirit, which always calls for courage to pursue justice and peace. Ours is opportunity to build relationships of trust and integrity, to open our doors to those who are struggling with issues of identity, to embrace those who are different by virtue of race or sex or sexuality or age or religion, to advocate for and participate in building an economy of life for all now where poverty is eradicated, equality disappeared, and the environment protected and cared for. Ours is the opportunity, and now is the time to make the church a credible witness to the gospel of hospitality and the lived experience of Jesus' promise and gift of life in fullness for all. The Holy Spirit provides us with impetus, the driving force, and the guidance for engagement with God's mission. The Holy Spirit can enable us to do the extraordinary, moving us beyond ourselves so that in turn we may be credible witnesses to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Obedience and submission to the Spirit are the hallmarks of Christian discipleship. Reverend Maureen Messiah, at the launch of this bicentenary of right, when he reminded this congregation that as beautiful and grand as this sanctuary is, ministry is more than the building. She said, it is the witness of the church that ultimately matters. It is the witness of the church that ultimately matters. I share these sentiments and fully support them as a direction for a church in the very center of life in the corporate republic of Iran. I pray, I pray with you and for you that the continued outpouring of God's Spirit will be upon your lives and I encourage you to remain focused and diligent in your call to discipleship and Christian witness. I encourage you to take your calling seriously by surrendering your life to the prompting and the perfective urging of the Holy Spirit.